Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second interview of High AR Week here at OC University. So in case you guys are new or don't know what this is, OC University is basically this improvement-focused OSU hub where our goal is to sort of bridge that gap between top players and the general community. So in keeping with that theme, something we do here is these series of interviews where we take one week dedicated to a specific topic and we interview a bunch of different players. And this week, this is the third interview series that we're doing here on the topic of high AR. And with me today is I'm a fancy lad. Oh my god. Hello. What's hey, up, man? man. Yo. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, to those people listening who are not very familiar with who you are, could you just give a sort of brief introduction as to you know who you are in the community and what people probably know you as? Yeah. So um, I think a lot of people probably nowadays know me for my tournament play. Um, I pretty much exclusively play tournaments. I, I barely ever play in solo anymore, but um, I definitely kind of made a name for myself with some like tech and alt scores towards the beginning. Um, and then just, you know, as I became consistent at tournaments and then eventually became, uh, got, eventually got on the World Cup team for the US and became the captain of that. Um, so, yeah. Let's go. Also, mouse player? Mouse player, indeed. Yes. I think you're typically the go-to answer these days when people ask, like, who's the best mouse tournament player or something like that. So, yeah, let's go. So, uh, on that topic, I think, uh, for the most part, probably during the session, I want to talk about um, high AR as it relates to tournament play and how you feel like yeah. it sort of it is involved in being a well-rounded player as a whole. Um, but yeah, for starting out, I want to sort of touch on what how exactly you would define high AR first of all, and I guess you were sort of upbringing when it comes to your experiences with getting better at high AR. Yeah, so um, I think for me, I would say high approach rate like you know I, I think just high in quotation marks is like very um very vague but i i would say definitely anything above like ar 10.3 is usually what i start thinking of as like high approach rate um and then i would include ar 10.3 in that category for things that are less generic like um you know tech or alt styled dts um i, I would also consider that high approach rate so the, uh actually would you say that like the complexity of the map also sort of dictates how quote unquote high the high AR range is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also even um, you know, there's this concept of note density where the the BPM and approach rate combination can affect like how fast it feels like the the notes are appearing and how long you have to react to it. So um even in some cases like, you know, playing hard rock on really low BPM maps can feel like really high approach rate since the density is so low. Right. Right. So I wanna sort of ask like when you um were sort of starting out as a player like what were your experiences with like passing certain approach rate barriers like did you have any certain strategies um to be honest as i was like still in the improve you know the improvement mode where i wasn't super involved in like you know being conscious about what i'm playing um i mostly just stuck between air 9 and 10 um i, I felt like like my first air 10 map was airman <laughs> oh. sure most people can relate to that yeah. but uh, you know, especially from those days. But I, I didn't think it was too terribly difficult to read, but I definitely, um, you know, there was some, like, memorization. There was some memorization that went into it um, when I first started to, like, you know, try to pass Airman or other Air 10 maps like the Big Black, things that were popular back in those days. Um, so, yeah. Other than that, though, I think um, I, I didn't really focus on it. it. It was more of, like, a side effect of other things that I was doing and other maps that I was trying to play that I ended up learning high approach rate pretty well. So up until like AR10, for the most part, like, were you playing Nomad for the most part as well, do you think? Yeah, yeah. So I was like a strict Nomad only player. Um, and part of the reason was because I just was not fast. I had no speed, no stamina at all. So I would just only play Nomad, um, usually tech. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then as I started to develop my mechanics a little more, then I started getting into higher approach rates because I, I needed it to play DT to be able to farm. Um, Let's go. So, yeah. <laughs> uh so uh what so i think it's pretty common for a lot of players to have a sort of wall at ar10 especially with mm -hmm. trying to get into hard rock um did you have any i guess pointers or like your own anecdotes on that um so one thing i remember having a discussion with dead zoned around um the time that i was first getting into tournaments was i, I was talking to him about like 
how I felt Hard Rock was more difficult to use on easier maps than it was on harder maps. I think that kind of goes back to, you know, that idea of note density and things like that. Right. Um, but, yeah, as I got introduced to the tournament scene, I realized, like, you know, oh, I really need to learn air above 10 because I'm, I'm getting abused on some of these picks. Um, so it started out with just memorization. Like, pretty much every, every week I would just memorize the DT1 because um, I, otherwise I wouldn't be able to play it. And, um, right. Yeah, and then shortly thereafter, I think... So I, I started to use Gamma after a while, and I think that the, the way I found that, um, I saw someone talking about it, and I tried, I tried it on the map Future Sun. Uh, I'm sure you know the Future Vinx, Sun. The Vinxus map, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I was trying to farm it 3 mod, and I, I learned that Gamma made that a little bit easier. And I, I remember at first, when I set the score, I was like, oh god, I hope that Gamma is allowed. And I remember like, <laughs> panic messaging Doomy, who didn't even know who I was at that point. And I was like, dude, is AR-11 bannable? Or is Gamma bannable? And he's like, no, I don't think so. Like, Wolfie well, sees it. And I was like, okay. That's good. <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was totally panicking. Yeah, do you think it should be bannable? Current? No. Could you, I guess, sort of elaborate on, on why? Because um, it's something, like, I think it's, uh, it's just a setting on your computer, like screen brightness. I mean, it's, it's no different than changing your sensitivity or something like that right um, you, you know if it, it seems it seems weirder because you know there are people like me for example who adjust my gamma on almost every map that i play but you know if, if someone was playing and they adjusted their sensitivity based on the type of map they were playing like i don't think anyone would have a problem with that so that's true um yeah, so, yeah that, that's interesting that's something i wanted to bring up that I, i've been thinking about that you basically change gamma for every map you say you have like yeah certain gamma ranges that you personally use for like sp specific ARs? Um, so I use, I, I don't, it, it's less dependent on the approach rate and more dependent on the density of the map. Okay. Um, I would also, say wait, 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 a bit, bit of a disclaimer because um, you're going to be mentioning like specific values that this is uh, w one personal uh, point of view, you know, reference point. Sure, yeah. <laughs> that, and so right, your mileage may vary. Right, and the other thing is a lot of people change their gamma in the NVIDIA control panel. I actually do not. Um, you can just use, if you're on, I know at least for Windows 10, if you just search calibrate display color in your Windows taskbar, um, then you can open a little menu. It's just like a little slider that goes up and down. I'm, I'm just oh. going to post a screenshot of that in the chat really quick. So yeah, sure. You can see. Um, so that's just what it looks like. So, yeah, usually... Pretty much for anything 10.3 or above, I just crank it all the way up to the max. Um, I, I think that's just become a comfort thing. Like I, I'm just so used to it at this point um, since I've been doing it for so long. And I think it's very possible that at this point it might be completely placebo for me. Um, but you know, placebo or not, it works. And right. it, it feels more comfortable to play, so I just keep doing it. <laughs> so, are, there, are there any number values? No, there are no slider? number values. Okay, so it's just a slider. Um, yeah, okay. so... Usually, 10.3 or higher, I crank it all the way up. Um, if it's AR8, usually I crank it all the way down, like AR8 or lower, no mod or hidden. Um, and then certain types of maps, usually like flow aim hiddens or alt maps, are the things I have to adjust it slightly. Um, so I will usually turn it down like a third of the way or half the way. Oh. Um, and I, I think that my my general rule of thumb is like when I'm learning maps for a pool i kind of um i try to look at replays and see if i'm having a tendency to over aim or under aim and so if i notice under aiming then i turn it up a little bit if i notice over aiming then i turn it down a little bit and usually that um helps me fix those problems a little bit oh that makes sense makes sense um yeah so actually what about hard rock do you just leave it at default hard rock yep hard rock i leave it at default um, okay I, I feel pretty comfortable at air 10 at least so Right, the, the, I do want to throw out also that I think there are players that do, like, like top tournament players that change their gamma, even for Hard Rock, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I think it, so what you should really keep in mind is it's very dependent on where your current reading speed skill lies as well, because mm -hmm. that will determine how much you should change your gamma and, and for which types of maps. But um, Yeah, and also what monitor panel you have. <laughs> true, true. Um, okay, so. Aside from, okay, so I think so far we've touched on Gamma, right? And 
um, how you sort of initially started out by just memorizing maps. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you feel like has helped you with sight reading high ER? Yeah, so the big thing with learning to sight read high ER is I think um, kind of just the play style that I had where, you know, I didn't have a lot of speed, but I was really good at like gimmicky stuff. Um, had a really big influence on the type of maps that I was playing. Um, so a lot of times, like back when I was still playing solo primarily, what I would do is I would just sort by difficulty and I would look for maps with no DTFCs. Um, and usually the maps that are low star rating with no, DT no DTFCs, like, you know, they have no FCs because there are weird things in there. Right. Um, especially when you play with double time. So, you know, that doing that and kind of hunting for those number one on leaderboards, um, that really caused me to... I, I had to get used to reading, like, very weird gimmicky patterns on higher approach rate. Um, and so after spending so long doing that, um, coming back and playing, like, you know, a generic 10.3 pick in a tournament, I just, you know, it felt like nothing because it's just so much easier to read than, you know, rhythm complex, you know, rhythm complexity or, you know, alt patterns or perfect overlaps, things like that. So, oh, so like learning higher ARs on more complex maps actually made it easier for you to go back down and do it on simpler yeah, maps? I think definitely, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense actually. Um, I know in the interview with Matrix, we talked about how, like, if the map is more complex, it actually it takes longer to read. Like pretty much anyone can get to the point of playing like simple farmy maps with AR eleven. They're so simple. Yeah. But um, Agreed. definitely not like more complex stuff. It's a lot trickier. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to touch also, and and we can go back to some of the previous topics as well. But I want sure. to touch on, um, like, exactly how necessary it is to get better at reading high AR. Uh, specifically for tournament play, I would say. There's a question that came in the forum from Lemuz, who asks, do tournament players really need to have the ability to read over 10, like over AR10, to progress in the global ranking and or to become better at tournaments? Yeah. So in the context of tournaments, um, I mean, I, I think I just have a general attitude toward tournaments that like you should try to minimize the number of things that you can't play always. Um, so, you know, it's definitely good to specialize um and you know make sure that you have spots on teams by you know playing things that not a lot of people are comfortable with but if your goal is ever to play solo tournaments then you absolutely need to minimize the number of things that people can abuse against you and so um high ar in my opinion is one of the most important because you know it, it's not quite as bad as speed where like you know if you can't play a speed map you literally have no chance right um because it's you know a very physical limit right. but i think high high approach rate is in a similar vein where you know, you either have to go out of your way to memorize the map every week, or you're just going to have no chance against someone who can play it. So, That's true. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's very important in that sense. And also just as the tournament scene progresses and as people get better, um, you know, we've already been seeing much higher approach rates introduced into tournament pools in the last year or so. I've seen um, in Corsair's Closed, we had a map that was AR 9.3, and it was like a complex map. It was not generic at all. Oh, yeah, 9.3 um, GT, by the way, which is like 10.5, 10.6. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think it's even becoming pretty standard now that in late stage, at least in open rank, like usually by semifinals, the DT1 is 9.2 DT instead of 9. Um, right. So I, I think just as the skill ceiling increases, it's going to become more and more important to incorporate that because... Um, already in late stage pools, you're expected to be able to play 10.3 like on every DT slot now, not just DT1. That's true. So, I think that yeah. the thing about tournament play at higher um, like late stage map pools that are very difficult is mm -hmm. they assume that they've already weeded out all the players with like lower skill cap. I think especially in modern day, yeah. having a high skill cap is that like you like high approach rate is associated with high skill skill cap as well. So like mm -hmm. if you made it to late stage and your high AR is weak, then you kind of should get abused on that, I feel like. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, and I, th I think just in general, tournament pools are, um, at least in late stage, starting to lean more towards like skill cap testing than consistency. Right. That's been um, the case, I think, since like 2019, I feel like. But yeah, it, it's, it's been, the pools have been getting very hard in open rank. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, also, probably a bit of an outlier situation, but in Drenched program, it was a couple months ago. There was a mm -hmm. Hard Rock Double Time with AR11. It was a relatively yep. simple map, but um, yeah, Magic Girl. I don't know if there were any other maps in that pool. 
that. Uh, um, I think I think that was the only one. Yeah, the only yeah. AR eleven. But but yeah, it just goes to show. But yeah, yeah. and uh, I'm sure a lot of people saw like in the last match, Vaxe versus Arnold. Like you know, Arnold had no chance because Vaxe could read it and he couldn't. And there that's was, true. It was just over. So yeah, definitely what I was talking about. Like you know, getting abused on that. Right. Though I, I do want to mention, I think Vaxe said that he like made practice difficulties and memorized the map. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do, do you have any insight on that? Like, is there really value in, or like, are there sort of right or wrong ways to memorize a map efficiently for a tournament in particular? Um, I think that is going to be very player dependent. Um, for me, usually if I'm trying to memorize something, I do the same thing. I use a lot of practice diffs. Um, just like, for example, currently on the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm having to memorize easy stuff for uh, old map fantasy. Um, and so I generally I'll play through the map at like, you know, five to 10 times on the first day just to um, kind of get a feel for the rhythms and stuff. And then I start going back, like looking through the editor to, you know, figure out what rhythms are happening, uh, making practice diffs for things that feel weird. Um, and then just generally like feeling like you practice it until you get to the point where you're not missing because you don't understand a pattern. Like you should only be missing because you miss aimed or didn't tap fast enough for, you know, things like that. Right. Um, so you want to you want to try to narrow it down to that as best as you can. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I like my personal rule of thumb is like if I'm practicing a map pool, like if I play a map and I misread something, then that means I haven't practiced the map enough. Basically. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Yeah. So I, I think if it's like a really really high AR, so sometimes I mean for me it might take like 20 or 30 local scores just to get sure. somewhat comfortable and like um there, there were, I don't remember what tournament it was, but it was some rubber conquest, 2019, I think. But um, so like AR 10.6 jump map or something like that in the DT pool, and yeah. I my first local scores were like 100k, 200k, like C ranks. Mm-hmm. But I was like, no way, I'm learning this map. <laughs> so I <laughs> played it like 30 or 40 times, and eventually I, I think I got like second top score in, in the match, which is pretty, nice. you know, y- y- you'll you'll be able to make it. Like worst yeah. case scenario, at least in the context of tournaments, you can always just memorize the map. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And on that note, um, more towards poolers than players, but I, I do still believe like tournaments. I, I absolutely believe in skill cap pushing, but um, I still don't like to see maps in tournaments that feel like like the majority of the players would have to memorize. Um, That's so fair. I think cause just you know going back because I saw you know some debates on Twitter happening recently about. Um, a map that the portrait was nerfed for the tournament, um, and people were saying like, you know, shouldn't players of this caliber be able to read this? Oh. Um, but I, I think that, like, uh, that that map specifically, it was a uh, flashback top diff, and right, um, right. I, I think that with something like that, like the main focus of that map wasn't really the approach rate; it was more the gimmick that that map was employing. So, um, adding a higher approach rate cap to it as well, I thought was a bit silly. Just um, you know, I, I thought that the nerf was justified, is what I'm trying to say, for the approach rate. So, yeah. Do you? Um. I okay. So, I, I, it's changing topics. Sorry, I, I had no idea how to word the transition. But basically, oh, you're good. <laughs> um. Yeah. On the topic of skins, I want to talk about uh, mm-hmm. if if that sort of influences your ability to read high AR at all. Yes, definitely. Um, I have two skins that I use, which is. It seems like a low number, actually, because most people I see like switch skins all the time. But I, I only have two skins that I ever use, um, and so I have one for pretty much like a skin for playing with Gamma, basically, and then I have another skin that I use for everything else. Um, so yeah, I think that one of the biggest things for me is making sure I'm using a skin that doesn't hurt my eyes when I'm looking at my monitor, because um, it. it you know, if you have a skin with a lot of bright, flashy colors and stuff, and then you try to turn your gamma up, it's really not good for your eyes. Right. So you you want to try to find something a little darker. Um. So yeah, my my skin is pretty similar to Rafa's skin, I believe, that I use for DT. But yeah. Do you have any, I guess, like reason why you feel like Rafa's skin helps more than anything else for gamma? Um, just because it's darker, it's one single uniform color. Um. And so, just in general, it's it's a little easier on your eyes, in my opinion. Um, I, I think that people who play DT without gamma, I think it's a lot less important that you, like which skin you're using. But um, yeah. Okay, so 
what really helps the most for you for like Rafis's type skin is that it works well with gamma. Yeah. If, if you're not going to use gamma in the first place, then it doesn't make as big of a difference, you'd say? Right, and, and if I didn't use gamma, I would never use that skin. Because it, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look good without gamma. In <laughs> oh, my interesting. Um, okay, so a couple... Is it, there's a couple questions that I feel like are... Uh, that came in on the forum, and okay. they're sort of like myth-type, like myth-grounded questions that <laughs> I think are debunkable. So let's probably okay. try to go through a couple of those. Yeah. Okay, so one question that came in on the forum is, how long does it usually take to learn AR11? Not including the time it took to learn the lower ARs to reach that point. Okay. So how long does um, it take? <laughs> that is a good question, because, I mean, if, if you're talking about how long does it take to memorize the specific map that is AR11, then that depends on the map and what it contains. But, um, you know, I don't think there are very many people who can really read AR11. Um, I know there's a lot of people who say they can, and maybe they can read it on generic maps, but um, I don't think that that's really proficiency on AR11 as a whole. So that's that's just a pretty hard question to answer because you know it's going to depend on the person, it's going to depend on your reaction times, it's going to depend on what monitor you're using. Um, and I, like I said, I think that there are very few people who can actually read it comfortably on like all types of maps. So. Um, that's a, a question that maybe we'll have an answer to in a few years once more people pass that skill cap. But. That's true. And okay, also, I guess regarding AR11 in particular, do you feel like it's necessary for even faster ARs to exist in the game for AR11 to become something that's readable? <laughs> um, Does that question kind of make sense? Like, would you? Yeah, yeah I yeah, get yeah, what okay. you're saying. I think, honestly, um, I find it very unlikely that people will ever be able to truly read things higher than AR11. Um, that's just me. I think that that is getting very close to a limit. Right. And I think that that's, that's shown by the fact, like, just how few people can actually read it even now when the game is, you know, what, like 13, 14 years old? 14, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that is definitely approaching a real limit. Um, but I will say, I do think that mappers should have the option to make their maps have a base higher than 10. Um, oh. But I, yeah, as, as the skill ceiling gets higher um, and there's better you know, top players and stuff, I think that that's going to be necessary. Because, again, like going back to density versus approach rate, like, you know, some of these maps that are coming out today, like you know, people want to map 10 stars and get them ranked. Um, a lot of times the density is very, very high, even on AR-10, to the point where it becomes almost unreadable. Um, so I, I definitely think that there should be an option to have a base higher than 10, but I, I don't think that the cap needs to be any higher than 11, personally. That's interesting. I mean, naturally, just by how DT works, then it, it would end up being higher than 11, the cap. Right, right. But it's, um, I, I think it should be similar to uh, circle size scaling with hard rock. Like, that's oh, okay. a hard cap at 10. I see. Um, so, I see. yeah. Um, okay, I, okay, next question is on the topic of hidden versus non-hidden or high AR. Do you have any, I guess, just general thoughts when I say that? Yeah. Um, personally, I prefer without hidden. I think that that is very common for tournament players because we get so used to reading DT maps without hidden. Um, and for me, it affects my aim a lot, actually. I, I just have a much easier time aiming things when I don't have to play with hidden. Um, so that's usually my preference, but I think... People make the joke that hidden is a preference mod, which is not true always, but I think at really high approach rate it is true, personally. Um, I think that there are maps, you know, specifically in the lower approach rate range, where um, hidden makes it a lot harder, for sure. But yeah, at, especially as you approach AR11, I think that it becomes a preference mod. Okay, yeah, yeah. So do you think... Um... Oh, yeah, actually, hold on. Okay, let me try to summarize. My, my brain like did not know where to go. Um, <laughs> okay, so for tournament play in particular, oh, yeah, so what I was going to say is you, like, as a tournament player, there's some mod combinations that don't exist. And the most common mod combination that straight up doesn't exist in tournaments is hidden double time. Right. So AR is above 10 with double time or with, with hidden is never ever going to get tested in a tournament. So, right. Um, yeah. Do, do you feel like um, it's sort of transferable? Like, if you can read high AR without hidden, then, like, are you going to need to start from ground zero when you turn on hidden? Oh, no, definitely not. 
Um, okay. I, I think it, it would be comparable to just turning on hidden on, you know, a normal AR 9.6 map. Like, it's, it's going to depend on your hidden ability, but it's not going to have anything to do with the approach rate. Right. And it, even in that sense, you said that turning on hidden on higher ARs has even less of an effect than on lower ARs, right? Yeah, definitely. So, um, yep. all right. Do you have any, I, th I think probably for this interview, I'll try to take a couple more uh, viewer questions and just like try to knock out as many questions as possible, I feel like. So, yeah, um, sounds good. Yeah, do you have any other topics that you, or like things that you wanted to mention about high AR in general? Um, or... Honestly, not really. I think, um, again, just, you know, my perspective learning high AR from, you know, from the context of a tournament. Um, I think we've covered mostly everything that I had wanted to talk about. <gasps> All right, let's go. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, actually, I want to ask about um, follow points. This is a bit of a biased question, but okay. um, yeah, because personally, okay, so I, I'm not sure. I, I think you probably know where I'm going with this, but to, yeah. to those who don't, so the default follow points are very, very dense, and on higher ARs, they basically show up before the circles do. Um, mm -hmm. On most ARs, they're like too dense to be readable, but on higher ARs, they become like, the speed of like a typical AR, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you like? So, do you have any experience with using dense follow points? <laughs> so, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Like, if you ask me about my DT skin, I don't know if it has follow points or not. <laughs> I, I play with it like every time I play, and I have no idea if it has follow points or not. I think it does, but okay, yeah, someone says it, it does, but. That does is not something that I think about too much. Um, I know that I experimented with actually your skins because um, oh. I know you have differing follow points that like you use for different approach rates. But right. for me, for me personally, it doesn't feel like it makes that much of a difference. I think um, from what I've experienced, gamma and follow points is like you you do one or the other. I feel like because when I use my dense yeah. follow point skin with gamma, then it it's like completely it's not helpful at all. But um, yeah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, just wanted to get your thoughts on that since, <laughs> yeah. since I thought about it. But um, cool. Yes, okay, so those of you guys listening live, if you join the Discord server, there is a text thread named Live Chat. You can ask your questions there. We'll try to knock out as many questions as possible. And what we do typically is if you see someone else's question that you would also want asked, if you could react to it with a thumbs up emoji, that way we can keep track of all the questions and answer the most wanted ones. And while those questions are coming in, do you have any, I guess, key takeaway summaries that you want to shout out to anyone trying to learn high AR specifically for tournaments or really just yeah. in general? Yeah. So um, I think, like I said, I think the number one thing that helped me when I was learning high approach rates was playing those really complex maps um, and really gimmicky stuff on high approach rate. And then kind of just coming back to more generic stuff after that, um, it, it just felt almost trivial when you know beforehand it had been something that i really struggled with so that would be the number one and then also i think that there is value in memorizing maps um a lot of i i see people when they give advice a lot they say you know like don't memorize things um because you're just building muscle memory but i think there is an extent to which muscle memory is helpful especially on higher approach rates like think because it, it feels very like reaction time based almost right even though it might not totally be but um Creating muscle memory for that can be good, in my opinion. So, right, I think, um, and personally, for memorizing maps, I think when you like just play the same map over and over again, you're also sort of getting used to just processing patterns at that speed in the first place. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, yeah, definitely agree that there is some merit there. Um, okay, first, first question from the live chat comes from Migs. Does having the ability to read lower ARs, like under eight, help slash affect readability on high AR? So um, that is an interesting question. I guess I hadn't really thought about there being a connection to the two, but the one thing I will say is I think that as you get to the extremes of the spectrum, either super low or super high AR, um, it becomes really important to kind of process those patterns that you're seeing on your screen um, with the music rather than trying to process them visually. Um, so I, I think at either end of the spectrum, like if you're trying to just react to the notes and hit them, uh, you're going to have a really hard time. But if you can like really focus on the rhythms of the song and feel like, um, you know, unless there's some mechanical limit, like, you know, you're tapping the rhythms regardless of what your aim is doing, 
um, that's really helpful. So, you know, you can kind of train that skill on lower pro traits, perhaps, and then, you know, maybe that will help you a little bit on higher pro traits, but I, I do still mostly think of them as separate skill sets. Oh, okay, that's actually a good point. Like, basically, like, rhythm sense training. Um, is that something that you have found improve over time that helps you with learning maths with high AR as well? Like, when you, like, expecting a certain type of pattern on, like, a certain part of the song, like, if there's a triple on every like same part like whenever the song repeats mm -hmm. itself like is that something that you try to pick up on when trying to learn about oh yeah absolutely um and, and i will say just in terms of rhythm sense um i i definitely had somewhat of an advantage i have a music background so i think some of that definitely translated when i was learning the game um but yeah i, I think it's very important to try to pick up on things like that um because yeah it, it's just it's so helpful for learning the maps and like once you because like most songs are repetitive right like that's the reason why a lot of um super rhythmically complex maps are so hard it's not necessarily because of the rhythms themselves but it's just the fact that it's not consistent and it doesn't repeat um right which is so, not what you're typically used to because most songs do that right exactly so yeah if you can learn the way that the rhythm repeats that's definitely very helpful yeah but to those who are curious what, what instruments did you play um so i played the violin for i think 13 years ish oh my god um, yeah and I, I, bri I briefly played the trumpet for a couple of years but um then i got to middle school and had to choose one or the other so i chose violin oh i see <laughs> yeah all right question from mort is it possible to skip ar levels like 9 to 10.5 or to 11 instead of practicing ar level by level um so that is an interesting question i think that that kind of stems from like Maybe a disconnect from the way that you think of a pro trait versus how I do. Um, I, I would say that it, it matters more uh, note density. So if you um, if you're trying to like learn a map or have a map where you know you already feel comfortable and you're trying to push the pro trait higher and higher to get used to it, um, then I think it is beneficial to go in order. Um, but in terms of just learning these pro traits in general, um, you're gonna find that 10.5 may feel easy on one map and 10.3 might feel e might feel really hard on something else so I, I think that that's just something to keep in mind when you're talking about like increasing those approach rates because you know different things are just going to be harder to read based on how they're mapped right it, it, it's not linear although the numbers themselves obviously increase linearly but right. um it's comparable to like saying okay i'm going to improve by just playing like 0 0.01 star rating higher than the next map right yeah exactly <laughs> so uh, yeah, obviously there's some sort of increase in difficulty as you get higher in the star rating, but it's not perfectly that way. So, right. um, yes. Okay. So next question from Arya. Okay, I like this question a lot. How do you transition from a low AR map like Hidden Two to a higher AR map like Hard Rock or Double Time maps in tournaments? So transitioning between extremes of ARs like in a tournament match. Yeah. So um, that is very tricky. Um, I, I think that that honestly, like, that can kind of come into my strategy for picks sometimes. Um, if I know that I'm playing against someone who's not as experienced as I am, then that is something I'll definitely abuse. If they, you know, if they pick something on one extreme, I'll try to pick the other immediately. Um, just because, like, that's something that I've, that's just kind of an ability that I've developed um, after playing in so many tournaments and being forced to make that transition really quickly. Um, I will say, you know, in terms of learning that, it's a good, just, good practice in general to when you're practicing for a tournament like try to mimic as many of the try to mimic as much as the of the match environment as you can while you're practicing um so like if you know that you're going to be playing at 10 o'clock in the morning on the day of your match um throughout that week try to practice at that same time so things like that um can definitely help just with you know tournaments in general and then for pro trade specifically um you know getting that practice in in solo play switching back and forth a lot um, can really make a big difference. And sometimes, you know, you, you have like two minutes between each map, so sometimes you can even dip out of the match really quick and go play <laughs> the first 15 seconds of the map and then, you know, feel like you've at least made a start towards that transition. Yep, let's go. <laughs> uh, don't take too long, though. It's a fair warning. Don't take too long to come back. Um, yeah. I also want to... Especially depending oh. on who your ref is. Yes, depending on your referee. Some, yeah. But that, that's, that's another conversation. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I do want to add what you mentioned earlier about um, reading by the music versus reading by processing. I think if you sort of read by the rhythm of the song, that can help a lot, at least in my experience, with 
like transitioning very quickly between that, extremes. Yeah, that's very true. If you if you already have that skill built up where you're processing the rhythms primarily, then yeah, I, I think it's not as jarring of a transition if you already play like that. All right. Um, okay, so th this seems more like an opinion question or like your your take. Okay. But here we go. Question from Voltron: How far can high AR rooting go to play maps well with only three or four plays? So like, you you're asking like, what is uh, I, I think the theoretical limit? I I think it's yeah. Like to what extent can you get like can you play a high AR with only like well like basically without memorizing it? I'm pretty sure that's what it's asking. Okay. Um, I mean, at that point, I think that there are going to be differences between people based on reaction time. Um, so that that's just a tricky question to answer. I, I think that um, you know, in general, most people can learn 10.3 pretty comfortably, probably. Um, but going higher than that, and in terms of being able to sight read it, um, I, I think it's going to be very tricky for people to get close to AR-11 or to be able to read AR-11 comfortably, especially as we were talking about on more like complex maps. Uh, yep. Yeah. Mostly, mostly agreed. agreed. Okay. Uh, yeah. Question from the Google form, actually. So they asked, okay. how do you not forget low AR reading when practicing high AR? It's always been a problem for me. As soon as I start practicing something like 10.3, my general reading suffers on low AR maps like Nomad. Yeah, so um, I think that you just have to be very intentional about the way you're practicing and, like, you know, just the fact that you're observing that, you know, certain things fall by the wayside when you practice high AR, um, you know, just make a note of that and say, like, you know, how am I going to incorporate these other things that I feel like I'm starting to lack in into my play sessions while still, you know, trying to push my high approach rate skill ceiling? Um, so, you know, just... Like I said, just trying to be observant with that and um, making sure that you go back to those things. But like we were talking about before, I think that if, you, um, if you're processing the patterns based on the rhythms, then hopefully that should not be as much of an issue in the first place. Right. I, I think like switching between ARs or like having a broad range of ARs that you can read is very dependent on that, to be honest. Yeah, like re Reading by rhythm, for sure. De definitely agreed. Um, okay. A uh, question that came in from July. Okay, so I, I want to touch on... Okay, so the question is, what do you think personally is the best way to improve in tournament play? Uh, you can touch on this question a little bit, but I want to mention that the next interview series that we're doing is all about tournament strategy. So uh, yeah, look forward to that. So we'll go really, really in-depth on those sorts of questions in the next interview series, which will be in two weeks. So look forward to that. But uh, yeah, since you're here, do you want to have a bit of a quick response yeah. to... Yeah, so um, I think that for me, I, I kind of have two different, like, completely separate mindsets when I'm playing. And this is actually something I talk about when I coach people a lot. Um, but kind of this idea of, like, you know, am I playing for improvement or am I playing for a score right now? And so I, I think if you're playing for a score, um, you know, in a tournament match, like, you only get one chance to play the map or, you know, you're just trying to set a solo score or whatever, um, you know, I, I absolutely believe in, like, doing whatever it takes to get the score that you need right so you know that's tensing up double tapping mashing like you know whatever L literally doesn't matter just keep your combo right um but when you're practicing i think it's really important to um make sure that you're maintaining the proper form and the form that you want to have when you're playing um so you know for in the case of stamina just for example that's like you know making sure that you're not tensing up that you're staying relaxed you know whatever that you have good technique your hand position is good you have good posture you know all of that right um so I, I think that when you're practicing for tournaments, like it, it's very, um, very important to just know, like you know, if you're pushing your skill cap, if you're working on consistency, if you're practicing for map pool, and um, just kind of shift your mindset based on that, like you know, what exactly you need to do on whatever map you're playing. Um, so yeah, and I, I think that in general, solo play is a bit underrated for for tournament improvement because um, you know. In solo play, you have more opportunities to really push outside of your comfort zone and things. Because in a tournament, you're actively trying to avoid things you're not comfortable on. But in solo play, you should be doing the opposite. You should be pushing your boundaries on every skill set that you can find. So, All right. Yeah. Solo is your training grounds. Mm -hmm. For sure, especially as a tournament player. 
Yeah. So, um, okay, next question. Uh, okay, let's see. There was one. I lost it. Oh, yes. Okay. So, from Sladkaru, how comfortable should I get at certain high ARs? Should I always be able to sight read that AR or just be able to play the map after a couple of tries? Like, basically, do you need to get to the point where you can sight read the AR or what do you think? Uh, I think that that is going to come down to like personal goals for the game and that's going to depend on the person. I mean, you know, I, I think it's very important in general just to set goals for the game. Um, and that kind of can give you a roadmap of what you actually need to do to get, you know, to improve or to uh, get to where you want to be. So I think that if you are looking at, you know, one specific map and saying like, you know, I can't play this right now. What do I need to gain? What do I need to train in order to be able to play this map to get the score I want on it? Um, you know, then that's great. And if your goal is I want to be able to sight read 10.3, then there you go. But it's just going to be really dependent on what your goals actually are for the game. Um, so I don't think there's a way I can answer that for you. Uh, yeah, fair, fair question, to be honest. I, I definitely think there's sort of like a point in, or not necessarily a clear point, but at some point you sort of specialize or like decide the type of player that you want to become. Like, do you want to be well-rounded? Um, and then if you do want to be well-rounded, is it for tournament play or is it just to play whatever songs you want? Because e even then there's a divide. Um, yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, or like, do you just want to be really, really good at one thing? Like, you have inspiration. Of like, a speed player is very inspirational to you, and you want to be just like them. Something like that that you just want to specialize. So yeah, yeah, taking all that stuff into consideration comes down to the person for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, okay. So question from Mort. Okay, do you think streams are harder to hit than jumps on high AR? <laughs> um, well, I do because I'm bad at streams, but it doesn't have anything to do with the approach rate. <laughs> um, I. I yeah, I mean, I think that that's what it boils down. Like, high approach rate is more, you know, there, there's certainly an aspect to it of, you know, high approach rate as a skill in and of itself. But um, in terms of specific patterns, like, it really is more just of a, a byproduct of, like, what you are actually comfortable playing. Um, so, you know, on that same vein, like, a lot of people would not be able to play some of the really gimmicky stuff that I can play at high approach rates, but it doesn't really, a lot of times the approach rate is not the problem. So, yeah. Oh, that that's interesting, actually, because I I know um, Matrix mentioned yesterday in his interview that um, the like the uh, complexity of like the types of tapping, like if it's all single taps, then it's a lot easier to read than if there's like bursts and like other types of patterns that you have to process because there's effectively like two types of tapping. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you're interested in in that, I think we went pretty in depth on that in Matrix's interview. So, yes, next question. Uh, question from Cash and Clean. Uh, do you play maps you enjoy when learning high AR maps or maps that have lower star ratings to get used to it? Um, yeah. yeah, so to be honest, um, I kind of just only play maps I enjoy in general, unless it's in a tournament. Um, and usually if I don't enjoy a map, it gets banned. More, and that's like more of a priority for me than things that I'm bad at usually. Agreed. Um, so just for example, um, big offender. I, I'm I'm gonna rustle some feathers probably with this, but I hate Searle. Like if I see a Searle map in a pool, automatic ban. Oh, that's the that's the artist S three R L, right? Always gone. Yeah. Same. I cannot stand their music. So Same. yeah. That's a plus one. Good take. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I also am a very strong advocate for like you should be playing maps that you enjoy, songs that you like. That's yeah. most important. Definitely. Um, wait a minute. Someone just said me with polka dot stingray. Who said that? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Don't forget, we can ban people. Okay. <laughs> okay. A question from uh, Ayub who asked, how do you deal with bad days where you can't really read high AR? Is it a matter of patience? Yeah. So um, I kind of touched on this earlier in the interview, but um, my approach for training any skill set is just like, you know, if I have a day where I'm bad at X skill set for whatever reason, I just play something else. Um, and I, I think that that is like a really important mental attitude to have because that can definitely hold you back if you're like, you know, oh, I'm having a bad day, but I'm just going to power through it and I'm going to like let myself get tilted and all these things like that can be really detrimental to your progress. So um, yeah, I definitely recommend just play something else. It's all good. Like it'll still be there tomorrow. 
Um, actually, okay, on, on that topic, you sort of made me think about um, sort of like wh- when you like tilt play. You, mm-hmm. Do you feel like okay? Do you feel like tilt playing makes you more susceptible to mind block? Like even in future sessions, like in the long run. Oh, I don't know because I don't tilt play. Like, oh, that's wise. I, I mean, <laughs> kind of. So if I'm playing a tournament, like obviously I have to be there, and that's different. But in terms of solo play, like pretty much my methodology is I get on and I play till I stop having fun and then I get off and it is not uncommon for me to get on and play like 20 seconds of a map and then be like yeah and then just get off <laughs> so <laughs> yeah I, I don't know if I can really speak to that much to be honest um, that's interesting um, yeah. but okay so e- even not in regards to tilt playing do you feel like um, there's some association or like some words of caution that you could give for like Memorizing a map for high AR and mind block. Um, hmm. I think that if you find yourself mind blocked, I mean, this just goes with learning maps in general, like not necessarily even memorizing. But um, I think a lot of mind blocks can be like not necessarily fixed, but at least like made a lot less of an issue um, if you use like the the cutting edge replay controls to like slow it down frame by frame and like really make sure you understand what you're missing on and why you're missing there um because i've found for me like a lot of times just being aware of what i'm doing wrong will fix it so right and yeah. uh to, to those of you who, who want to learn a lot more about mind block we do we did an interview series on that as well so check out the youtube channel or spotify where you can find all those recordings um so yeah i, I do want to throw out there really quickly that um, definitely, I feel like mind block basically is like when you keep messing up a pattern and you don't know why. Mm-hmm. But like when you check your replay and you see why you missed, then you're not really mind blocked anymore because now you know. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, definitely. Okay, agreed. agreed. Good <laughs> answer. Um, okay, this is an interesting question from the forum. Uh, it's an anonymous question. How do you stop high AR from affecting aim? Um, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't. I think that when I when I go back, I, I like to watch my own replays a lot. Um, you know, look for things that I need to work on or, you know, just whatever. Um, but one thing I've noticed is my aim usually gets snappier as the approach rate goes up. Um, and I think right. that... I think that's pretty kind common. Of yeah, I, I think that's just in part to like you know how it's becoming more reactionary than anything. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that you necessarily need to stop that from happening. Like, you know, I, I mean, first of all, especially if it's getting snappier as the approach rate increases, like I think snappy aim is good. So um, personally, I don't I don't really see an issue with that at all. Okay, so it, it's really about like how you stop getting lower to, from affecting your aim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, um, do, do you have any tidbits I, on that? I'm still trying to figure that one out myself, <laughs> to be honest. So, you know. Gamma. Yeah, Gamma. There you go. Let's go. <laughs> um, okay, question from Slad Curve. It, would learning a higher AR than you need to and then going back down to the lower one, like learning AR 10.5 to learn AR 10.3, is that a viable way to learn higher AR? Um, yeah, definitely. Like, you know, especially if you. Uh, this is kind of similar to something that I know that Bubble Man does practicing for tournaments. Um, a lot of times he will make, like, at least from what I've heard, like, maybe he'll correct me. He'll come after and be like, I don't do that. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure that what he does is he takes all the maps and he makes them AR8 CS5 and learns them like that. And then when he has to go back and play them in the match and they're returned to their normal values, it feels a lot easier. Um, so I think that that sort of... Um, that sort of trick can be applied to pretty much anything, including high AR. Oh, I, I did that in OWC tryouts once, but I, I just made all the maps CS7. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Like, they just kept the same AR. I've actually experimented with um, changing, like, the AR also and the CS. And, um, and I think the OD, you know, it's just, just going crazy. But um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, you, changing the AR actually is almost like learning a completely different map. But just changing the CS, really? I think... Yeah, I think just changing the CS, um, it's basically playing. Okay, that is a lot more like playing the same map but harder, harder version. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas changing the AR, um, I mean, I I don't know. Maybe I just like didn't practice those maps enough for it to really have an effect. 
but I guess I guess yeah. I can see that argument, especially because you know we've kind of acknowledged that a lot of times changing the AR will affect the way that you aim it. Right. Um. So I can kind of see that, but I think that with a change as slight as ten point five versus ten point three, um, then it can definitely be viable. Right. I agree. So yeah. Um. Okay. So uh. So a up question from a up um says that it's not a high AR question, but I think it is actually kind of related. Uh, so how often do you watch your replays, and what do you look for in your replays when you watch them? Um, I, I mean, usually, if I get any sort of, like, score that I feel like is, you know, a good score or whatever, I, I always watch the replay after, um, just to kind of get an idea of, like, <clears throat> you know, things that I maybe screwed up slightly but still got the score. And it's like, okay, like, you know, watch out for that next time I play this map or things like that. Um, and also just, like, I, I try to look for general tendencies. Um, if I see, like, you know, I'm mashing this type of pattern or, I, you know, I'm not understanding the rhythms in X place or even, like, you know, I tend to overaim certain types of patterns. Um, those are the things that I try to notice. So. Oh, and, again, watching in slow motion is, is very important as well. Yeah, watching in slow motion is very good. Um, and then yeah, uh, one one more thing to look for, look out for is kind of like make a note of where in the map. Like if it's an FC score, something that you know you've been working towards. Like a lot of times you get nervous, right? right. Um, so kind of having an idea of like where in the map you started to get nervous um, can help you, you know, to start to try to calm yourself, <laughs> right? Um, you know, moving forward. Um, speaking of getting nervous, we also did an interview week on Nerf Control. You check out those interviews also. It's, everything's coming together. This is so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um okay but uh yeah d definitely agreed and i also actually want to mention um when so like when you, you so figuring out what part of the map you start to get nervous on mm -hmm. then like taking extra care to like learn those rhythms like memorize that Absolutely. part of the match more because you are like when you get nervous you sort of like your processing starts to deplete your ability to process kind of goes down it's a lot easier to misread when you're nervous. So, yeah, like I having those rhythms like hyper memorized so that even <laughs> when your reading dies, you can still like play the map. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I I always tell people um, that you know I, I kind of think you have a certain amount of mental energy that you can devote to the game, and anything that detracts from that is just going to make it harder. So like, you know, a great example of that is people feel like you know, like oh I can stream 200 BPM, but as soon as the streams require aim then my stamina goes. And it's like, you know, those things seem unrelated, but I think it's just, you know, when you have to dedicate some mental energy to maintaining your stamina or maintaining your tapping, um, then that's going to detract from your aim and vice versa. And I think the right. same thing applies when you're nervous. If you're thinking like, oh my God, I'm about to see this map, then that is actively taking away from energy that would otherwise be going to playing the map correctly. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that that's something that I, I tend to mention in coaching sessions sometimes as yeah. well. <laughs> Me as well, yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I I wanted to mention. Um, I also I sort of describe it as like mana, basically. Like you have like, for example, hundred points okay. of mana, and yeah. um, you you can like distribute them evenly throughout tapping, reading, aim. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I guess in, in that sense that that's a good point. Like mental fortitude to some extent. Um, like like nerves, things like that, also sort of subtract from your mana pool. Or like they steal some mana. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. So another question from this is from real life speed one trick. Wow, incredible, amazing. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, so what is the mindset to high AR? Like, do you need to anticipate the pattern and where you think the circles will be, or you just um should expect that a circle a circle could come at any moment? So uh, do you have like sort of anticipation of the notes beforehand, or are you just sort of like always on guard for like wherever the circle is going to show up? Um, definitely a sort of anticipation, um, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier about like, you know, reading really with the rhythms and, you know, by listening rather than visually. Right. Um, that's kind of where that becomes so important is like knowing what the rhythm is about to be ahead of the time, you know, especially cause you know, most songs are so repetitive. Um, so that is definitely very important. Um, and then in terms of like where the notes are going to be placed, um, that's not as important but sometimes you can still kind of anticipate it if you're familiar with the mapper of whatever map you're playing um because a lot of mappers have like very distinctive styles where you can kind of like predict the way that the patterns are going to be made 
That's um, true. And some of that like comes with mapping knowledge that is, you know, maybe less accessible to most people. So I think um, that that's definitely not as important, though, as like anticipating the rhythms. The rhythm should always be your number one priority. Right. And honestly, even if you don't know the mapper per se, um, like let's say you're halfway through the map and like you got past one hard part and there was like triples in certain parts of the song, then like in the next hard part of the map, like where the song sort of repeats itself, you're you can pro- usually typically expect like that same rhythm to happen again. Right. So um yeah, in that sense you can sort of be like, okay, I should be on guard for any type of pattern, but based on what I saw earlier in the map, there is probably gonna be a triple here. And so like yeah. sort of being mentally prepared to expect a triple and tap that if it ends up showing up is I think very important. You can sort of do some of the processing before the pattern actually shows up. Yeah. Um, and then also just making sure that you are comfortable on whatever BPM you happen to be playing, um, so that you can devote more of your energy to like, you know, processing the rhythms and reacting to the notes that are coming up right, on the screen. Right. Um, yeah, d- definitely. Like, um, it, I guess this is more about the connection between raw speed, like tapping speed and aim speed mm-hmm. versus like high AR. Like, if your raw like speed increases, then you're going to need to spend less energy on it, right? Sort of the same concept we were talking about before. Yeah. And so for that reason, you'll be able to um, play, you'll be able to read the maps easier just because you'll have more mana used up on your reading your high AR. Exactly. So, yeah. Um yeah. Okay. Uh one one more thing that I wanted to mention is um refresh rate, monitor refresh rate. That's <laughs> actually something I just realized we didn't actually talk about. Yeah. So, um Yeah, so I'm just going to be real with you guys. I see a lot of people who claim that there's no difference between 60 and 144 and that is cope. It's like not even close. <laughs> You you can feel the difference on your desktop, like it's it's crazy, right? Like um, you, you don't even need to be in like watching an yeah. OC game to yeah. OC. It's it's really like very drastic, and I know because I was one of those people who was coping before I was able to buy a good monitor <laughs> that I bought it. I was like, okay, that makes sense. Why everyone was telling me to get this? Yeah. So yeah, um, the difference between one forty four and two eighty or two forty, I guess, is what most people have. I I have two eighty personally. Oh, okay. um, but. I think that that's not as noticeable. Um, you know, maybe takes a little more of a trained eye to feel the difference. But personally, I, I can definitely feel the difference, um, especially playing Osu. Not so much moving my mouse around on the desktop. Yeah, that, but, that's a good way to put it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, so w- would you say it's necessary to have higher I don't, refresh rate? I don't rate? think it's necessary, perhaps. But um, I would be very surprised if it didn't help. Right. On, okay. So let's put it this way: on a scale of one to ten, how helpful is it for upgrading from sixty to one forty-four or high AR? How helpful is it? I would say like an eight. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How? Um. But you know, as we've seen from plenty of players, like you can get better at high approach rate on you know lower right. lower refresh rates or whatever. It's just harder. Right. Um. And I think that applies to a lot of things, like. You know, it's not like you can't get good if your setup sucks. It's just going to be harder. So, yep. yeah. It's like um, you can still chop down a tree with a dull axe. Right. It's just going to take a little longer. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Hopefully, I think that, that kind of wraps things up. Do you have any other things that you wanted to mention? Um, I think that's, that's about all I can think of. Um, well... You know, you you've made a lot of of really great points, and if anyone wanted to learn more from you, uh, do you do you by chance offer OSU coaching that people could sign oh, up for? I I actually do happen to offer OSU coaching. Oh um, really? I I made this I I had this idea for the server with my good friend Digital Hypno. And oh really? Like, what if we made an improvement hub and then offered coaching on the side? <gasps> oh my god! Wait, that's so crazy. Wait, what is it called? I want to join. It's it's called the OSU University, um, and I'm sure that you can. You can find all of the links that you would need in order to uh, to get to the server. They will be in the description of this video. Where yes, it's uploaded. yes, that, that's so true. Wait, OC University, I had no idea they offered coaching. Wait, so who, who are the coaches? So, so, someone yeah. just posted that Obama giving himself a medal. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. 
yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the the coaches are me, digital hypno, and Apraxia. Oh, and, Apraxia, um, my favorite speed player. Yeah, he's, that's crazy. He's very fast. He's, he's really um, speedy, <laughs> and very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable indeed. I would say I would say all three of the coaches are pretty knowledgeable. So, yeah. That that is true. I, I would have to agree, especially Mr. Mr. Fancy Lad. He's oh, so but, he's he's huge. He's ginormous. Well, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, um, other things. So, to those of you who, uh, who uh, to yeah, to those people who just want to get in touch with you or know where they can find you, um, this is your time to <clears throat> plug your socials, things like that, where people can find you. Yeah. So, I'd say probably the main social media that I'm active on is Twitter. Um, so it is just at I'm a fancy lad, no spaces. Um, that is probably the most reliable way. Like, I, you know, I will see right. messages. Um, other than that, I am honestly not, you know, I, the, the other main way is like just contact me through the OSU University Discord. Like, you know, if you ping me and I'm available, I'll answer your question. Um, right. But, you know, I am a college student, so time is not exactly yeah a commodity that i have a lot of but <laughs> i'll do my best <laughs> yeah um you also i think stream sometimes rarely but sometimes <laughs> yeah hopefully again hopefully as long as i can figure out my um my lag issues i'll be streaming owc at the very least so oh that's right twitch.tv i think it's fancy underscore lad is that right that, that is correct yeah all right <gasps> i remember let's go <laughs> um but yeah that's gonna wrap up this interview hopefully you guys learned a lot and there are many other well there's a couple other uh high air interviews throughout this week so right yesterday we did an interview with matrix and tomorrow we're doing one with mighty doc thursday we're doing one with rafis and then on friday we're gonna have a sort of open q a panel with multiple guests from throughout the week so let's look forward to that a lot more content to come and the best way you can support us is really just to spread the word if you want to share this content with anyone you think might appreciate it or find value out of it, I think that's the best thing you can do. And if you want to get directly involved, also, best thing you can do is join our Discord server. That's where things happen, basically. You can ask live questions during these and stay up to date with all the different announcements, things like that, other events that we might host in this server. But uh, yeah, hopefully you had some value out of this. And thanks again, Mr. Fancy Lad, for joining. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, and we'll see you guys next time.